morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, just uh, taking a look at some of the major concepts that we learned uh, back in IB11. Uh, we're going to do a quick uh, survey over, uh, in this lesson, uh, our stoichiometry as well as our atomic structure. Uh, tomorrow we'll come back and review through periodicity through to energetics. Uh, definitely uh, that summary notes package that I gave you uh, from last year will be very helpful. Uh, I'll attach a, a, a digital copy uh, under the resources column. Uh, as we step our way through here, I would encourage you to uh, just have your notebooks um, out, uh, just like you would in a regular class here. Uh, just copy down the notes as we go through, especially as we do practice through some questions as well. Uh, after we write down the question, I'd encourage you just to pause the question, uh, try the question out for yourself, and then you can always unpause the video and uh, check how you did with your work. So um, in this case here, we're going to start off uh, just looking at uh, chapter one. So this one here is uh, topic number one or unit one. Uh, we're going to call this one here quantitative chemistry. This one here was your favorite stoichiometry chapter. Uh, basically here, quantitative chemistry introduces to you all the math of chemistry. So uh, idea for idea, it wasn't very challenging. It was just sort of the pacing to sort of get used to. Uh, hopefully you don't have nightmares of the stoic tests, but uh, let's just look at uh, some of the major concepts that we see. So for starters, uh, we started looking at uh, carbon out of all the elements we could. Uh, our periodic table says carbon is atomic number six. We have a 12.01. Uh, what we did is because carbon was so common and so plentiful for us, what we decided to do was to come up with a uh, new unit for mass for carbon. And effectively that ends up as this 12.01 number. Uh, what we did is we started off with a scale. Uh, if we imagined here, we started off just with one single carbon 12 atom. You'll notice that I'm taking just the the lightest form of carbon. Carbon actually comes to us, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. For a carbon 12 atom, we just made up a unit and we defined uh, one atom of C12 weighs, or has a mass, uh, weighs exactly 12. Right? And it's actually best to say no units because everything is going to now be relative to carbon. If you really have to put a unit here, uh, in the past we used to say AMU, uh, but nowadays we just say U, and U is basically an atomic mass unit. And basically, this was trying to get us thinking about uh, the sizes of a particular atom. Of course, if I just use my diagram scales or my electronic balances, I don't have the precision of this. right? Uh, but the number 12 was special to carbon. It relates to the number of nucleons, the number of protons and uh, neutrons. So basically, I wanted the scale to still read 12. It's just not going to be 12 grams. It's just going to be 12 of these new units. So that was one way of thinking about it here. Fortunately for us, we never really deal with reactions just with one or two individual numbers of particles, usually we have a huge sample of carbon. And what's going to happen here is because the number 12 is so important, what we started doing is we started saying, what if I put this on a regular scale? What if I preserve that number as 12.00? And what if now we actually were grams? How many carbon 12 atoms would I need until this one here actually says 12 grams? In that case there, uh, we sort of extrapolate back here. This was a very special number. We would define this one here as called the mole. One mole was actually given by Abagazel. Avogadro's constant, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Right, so think of the mole as a box. It's a pre-packed container, always with a fixed number inside. The Avogadro's number here is a three six eight number. Right? Um, so there we go. That's how we defined it. And then now for all the other elements on the periodic table, so let me sketch this out for you here. Uh, say we have a periodic table like this. Say we have our hydrogen. Hydrogen has a number 1.01. We'll come back to that decimal part uh, later on in chapter two. But basically, when hydrogen is defined as a one, it is being relative to carbon. So carbon, which I'm calling 12, because one is about 12 times smaller than hydrogen, hydrogen is about 12 times lighter, not as massive than carbon. Or let's say magnesium here. Magnesium is um, sitting over here, 24.31, I believe it is. So 24 is roughly double what 12 is. I still have no clue what carbon weighs. I just chose 12 because it was a convenient unit. I have no clue what magnesium weighs, but relative to carbon, uh, it's about two times heavier, right? or two times more massive. So uh, in this case here, they define for us, uh, for that first conversion, they like calling this one here, define relative atomic mass. And essentially, you're just going to keep uh, seeing this phrase here. It's relative to 1 12th the mass of carbon 12. And that's based on the way we defined it. We just decided to call carbon 12. I could have called it anything as I was creating the unit, but I decided to call it 12. If carbon 12 is weighing 12, 1 12th of 12 is just one unit. And basically that uh, is what all the other um, units are in comparison. 
So it's always best to say no units because relative uh, is no units. All right, so what we did then is we said, all right, so if a container full, if I have an Avogadro number um, that weighs 12 grams, I now borrow this Avogadro number. Well, I don't have to have an Avogadro number of carbon. I can have an Avogadro number of hydrogen or an Avogadro number of magnesium. This ended up giving you a next conversion here called molar mass. Molar mass here, um, as the name suggests, it's the mass of one mole. It's the mass of one box full of that particular chemical. This one here is going to be in units grams per mole, right? Although it's best to say relatives, relative to carbon just being a straight 12, no units, we decide to put a gram on there so we can say one box full of this chemical uh, is this number of grams here. And this one here, you're going to get it from the periodic table. Uh, especially as I have compounds, I just add up all the molar masses of the different bits, and basically that would be the total molar mass. Uh, just moving on here, we did two other conversions here. One was molar volume. So volume talks about the amount of room that the gases will spread out into, it's sort of the balloon size. And this one here is the space or volume of one mole. But the sort of restrictions on this one here is one mole, it had to be of gas. And it had to be at a very special reference temperature and reference pressure. Under those conditions, we had seen molar volume as one mole is 22.7. IB doesn't like to say liter, so we're going to use decimeter cube. One decimeter cube is equivalent to a liter. So it doesn't matter what gas you are, as long as we are at standard temperature. Our standard temperature is zero degrees. Our standard pressure here is actually uh, one bar of pressure. Uh, under those reference conditions here, one mole of any gas occupies 22.7. Uh, while we're at it here, we also did one other um, liter to uh, mole conversion, and that was concentration. Concentration, we basically started uh, dissolving solids into liquids. The concentration describes how many moles of solute uh, is in a given volume of solution. So for concentration here, we're going to take moles of solute. I'm going to imagine solute is the thing that's in lesser quantity. We divide it out by the volume of solution, by basically... Um, uh, how much uh, liquid uh, those particles are now swimming in. Uh, we had a few different units for this one here. We can go grams per liter, we can do moles per liter. We use molar mass to convert between the two of those. If the concentrations got to be really small, we use parts per million, parts per billion, another very convenient unit. Uh, for us, if we really have moles on top and liters on bottom, in regular grade 11, moles per liter would be written as capital M. Again, for IB, because they don't technically like this uh, liter here, uh, dm cube is what they do. So for us, we're actually going to write this molar quantity as moles per dm cube. So if you pretend you have one full liter, right, concentration is intensive, uh, there would be this number of moles on the side. Uh, we can link these um, conversions here with a sketch of our mind map. So going from moles to a number of particles, we had used Avogadro's constant, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Yes, defined for carbon, but now borrowed for all the other elements. Moles over to mass, right? We use our molar mass. So this one here came from our PT, our periodic table. If you wanted to go over to a volume bubble, and this one here was a gas at STP, if we were at our special conditions here, we can say one mole is 22.7 decimeter cube. And then uh, if we add a solution here, also a volume bubble, but this one here is solutions. And in that case there, depending on the concentration at that point, we have C is equal to NRV moles divided by volume. And we saw how we can sort of interconvert between the two. Uh, some questions, I'll ask you a similar one later on. Some questions will ask you, well, I want to go to molecules, but then I later on want to go to atoms. So there was that little deviation there. Uh, also for uh, gases, we do one mole is 20.7 for SDP. What if we were not at um, um, the standard conditions? We then had two other formulas. One was called the combined gas equation. The combined gas equation had combined Boyle's law, Guy Lussac's law, and Charles's law together. This one here you have to memorize. P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. For this formula here, the top unit just has to be consistent units, just the same units. Uh, all the other conversions will die away. But for the temperature here, it has to be in Kelvin. So even if they give you the problem in Celsius, convert it first to Kelvin. So the Kelvin temperature is basically the Celsius plus 273. Uh, it's an absolute scale. If they ask you for the final answer in Celsius, convert to Kelvin first, do the formula, get the right number, and then convert back to Celsius afterwards. So that's one uh, way they can do it. The other way they can do it here is called an ideal gas uh, law. 
Remember, for ideal gas, we pretend that the particles have essentially no volume of their own. We pretend that there's no attractive forces or repulsive force between particles. Under those criteria, we actually have PV is equal to nRT. The formula itself is not all that hard, but in that case there, we really need to put everything back into SI units. Uh, ideally, pressure in pascals, volume in meter cube. We have N, which is moles. R is a universal gas constant, 8.31 joule per Kelvin mole, and then temperature has to be in Kelvin. Because we're not setting up a ratio, uh, we do need to put everything in SI. For chemistry, I find people uh, don't tend to like going Pascal and meter cube, because meter cube would be equivalent to a kiloliter. So what they decide to do for a Pascal volume, you can find that one Pascal meter cube, so in the correct units, is actually equivalent to one kilopascal with the decimeter cube, because what would happen here is we would have divided by a thousand to get from Pascal over to kilopascal, but going from meter cube to decimeter cube, we would have multiplied by a thousand. That would just cancel out. So as long as you're sort of clear, if I use pressure uh, as uh, kilopascals, it's just going to come out uh, with liters uh, as the unit. Uh, that would be fine. Right? Um, especially for our solutions, uh, we started doing dilution problems. For a dilution setup, we have essentially I have a certain amount of chemical that's already dissolved. I already have a C1 and a V1. As you add water to it, or even if you boil off water here, I'm going to imagine the number of swimmers stay the same. So under sort of this uh, solution column here, we did a dilution, which was C1, V1 equals C2, V2. And that essentially says the moles of particle before are equal to the moles of particles afterwards. Uh, upon evaporating here, we also think um, basically the the solvent, the liquid evaporates away, it assumes that the particles are actually intact. Right? So with that as a sort of a quick overview here, uh, we can draw out our big stoichiometry map. Hopefully you have this um, map internalized for yourself. Uh, what stoichiometry did, even though it seemed very scary, it actually only introduced one new conversion was the fact moles of A goes over to moles of B. If you want to compare what information you know about one chemical to another, you have to go through the mole ratio, also sometimes called the mole bridge. The mole ratio actually comes from your balanced equation. Your balanced equation acts as a uh, proportioned recipe, and basically it tells you the amounts going in uh, versus the amounts uh, that leave. So if we want to get to moles here, we can go... One mole is an Avogadro number, 6.02 times 10 to 23. If you wanted to go to mass, we would use our molar mass from the periodic table. If you had a volume specifically of gas at STP, we can then use uh, molar volume as our conversion. One mole was 22.7 decimeter cubed, didn't matter what gas it was. If we had a concentration, this one here was volume, and let's do a solution. And this one, depending on that particular mixture, we have C is equal to N over V. Once you've jumped chemicals here, you can totally go moles back to number of particles, use Avogadro number again, use the periodic table, add up uh, the masses in your uh, uh, product or whatever chemical that you're looking at. We can also go back to volume of a gas at STP, and similarly use concentration of the other solution to get volume of solution. Right. So that's sort of a quick overview of chapter one, some of the main conversions. Pretty much this mole ratio helped us convert between one chemical and another chemical. Anytime you have that sort of setup, you have to go through the mole bridge. The mole bridge works whenever we're comparing counting numbers. So they would work between moles of A and moles of B. They would also work between number of molecules of A, number of molecules of B. So that's fine. Mole ratio would work. Uh, we had a guy called Avogadro's hypothesis. Basically, because it didn't matter what type of gas we were, as long as there's no temperature and pressure switch, uh, we actually found that uh, the volumes also follow the mole ratios. So this was a guy known as Avogadro's hypothesis. Essentially, the volumes uh, followed uh, the same ratio as set by uh, Avogadro. So uh, just to practice a little bit of this here, I'm going to give you an expression. Uh, so let's say I have an example. Um, let's do... I have ammonia, it reacts with oxygen, we're going to produce water, and we're going to produce NO. I'm going to give you straight eliminating an excess question just so that you can practice it here. Uh, let's say I have 15 grams of ammonia. Um, uh, for the oxygen, uh, let's say I have um, 32 uh, liters of oxygen. That's a gas at SDP. And what I want you to convert over is I want you to find for me how many molecules of water do I get? So it's a standard limiting excess question. Uh, usually part A, they will ask you just which is limiting. 
Remember, in our strategy, as we try to answer this question along with uh, the part B of the question, usually once you know which one runs out first, so limiting runs out first, if you know which one runs out first, uh, usually uh, I would ask you, well, how much product do we end up making? So how many molecules of water form? And naturally, I can ask you, well, if one of them ran out, how much is extra? So how much excess remains? So again, I would encourage you to try it out for yourself, see what you remember, and then you can unpause and you can uh, check what we did. We know it's a limiting sex question because I have amounts of both. I went to the store and bought this much ammonia, I bought this much oxygen, because I totally randomly made up these numbers, there's a good chance that one of these is going to uh, run out first. So what we're, our strategy is, although you could totally make a comparison just between ammonia and oxygen, how much oxygen would I need to use up all the 15 grams, our strategy is actually going to involve, let's take the 15 grams, let's pretend all of it gets used up, let's pretend it's limiting. Let's find out how many molecules of water, in a similar fashion for oxygen, let's find out how many molecules of water. So let's go here. I'm looking for how many molecules of water. If they did not specify a product, you could have went to any one of these here. Uh, the key is you have to go to the same chemical with the same uh, unit. I also realize this equation is not balanced. So uh, in this case here, make sure you check for the balancing first. So this one here should be a 4, 5, 6, 2, 4. All right. So now with that, uh, we can do our practice here. I start off with 15 grams of ammonia. This is going to take a three-step conversion because I need to go grams to moles. Mole bridge is the only ratio to jump from ammonia over to water. And then they want you to go moles to molecules. So let's go grams to moles. And then moles of NH3 to moles of water. And then let's go moles back to molecules. If you're going to shorthand the word molecule, don't make it any shorter than M-O-L-E-C uh, or else it starts looking like moles. So we're going to uh, do the molar mass here. Molar mass of ammonia, make sure you're using your IP table, which has uh, two decimal places. So 14.01 plus the 3.03 .03 from the hydrogen, 17.04 grams for a mole. The coefficients will only enter this mole ratio step. When there's a 4 in front of NH3, there should be a 6 in front of water. Even though that amounts to a 3 over 2, I'll still leave it at 6 over 4 so that in case I make a mistake, you can actually see where I got those numbers from. And then in terms of Avogadro's number, one mole is 6.02 times 10 to 23. That's how many molecules that are in. Uh, numbers on top, you multiply. On the bottom, you divide. So 15, divide 17.04 times 6 over 4 times Avogadro's number. This one gives me here 7.95 times 10 to the 23 uh, molecules. Always do a mentor check for yourself here. Yeah, it makes sense that this is going to produce a ton of molecules. Uh, I don't know that's the answer yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the same unit, question mark molecules, of the same chemical water, but this time I'm going to pretend it was actually the 32 liters that actually got used up. This one here assumes the oxygen is limiting. Because this is a gas, you can assume that it's STP. We can use 22.7 decimeter cube for a mole. The mole ratio says for every five parts oxygen, there is a six part for water. And this gives me here, for every one mole, there's an Avogadro number. Technically speaking, you could have actually stopped the comparison just at moles of water. You could figure out which is a smaller number at that point. But because I do want to answer part B together, I may as well multiply Avogadro's number in. So 32 divide 22.7 times 6 over 5 times 6.02 E23. This one here gives me 1.01, uh, 1.02 1 .01 times 10 to the 24 molecules. So remember, both of these can't be correct, right? They're both under differing assumptions here. The first assumption pretended the ammonia was uh, limiting. When the ammonia ran out, you've only actually only produced 7 times 10 to the 23. The other one could actually produce 10 to the 24. Because this one is a smaller number, give me some summary statement. Therefore, I know the NH3 in this setup, NH3 is the limiting, usually they like using the word here reagent. Reagent just means reactant, it's ingredient, chemical, okay? So in this case here, the NH3 is the one that ran out first, and we actually know the smaller the two numbers gets produced. By the time you make the 7.95 times 10 to the 23 of your water molecules, the NH3 cut out. If you don't have any more NH3, you can't run the reaction anymore. It limits the production. And therefore, we've answered A and B in one. Uh, for our part C here, we're going to calculate the excess. There was two ways of calculating the excess. One way is starting off with the limiting. This number here becomes really important to us now because the entire 15 grams is completely guaranteed to be used up. The 32 liters, 
some of it reacts, some of it doesn't react. So that's why that one's a little bit problematic. So what you could do for excess, let's figure out how many liters of oxygen does the NH3 react away and then subtract from 32. Or the other way you can do it, uh, the way I'm going to show you, I'm going to minus off these two. Let's figure out how much extra water I could have made and then note that I have enough oxygen to end up making that extra amount. So I'm going to do that uh, method here. Uh, how many molecules, so in answering part C here, how many molecules of water, emphasis here is, it could have formed. It never actually got made because the ammonia had ran out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the subtraction. Take this 1.02 number times 10 to the 24. I'm going to minus off 7.95. I'm doing this method because I think people prefer to do this method. But both ways are fine. 1.02. E24 divided uh, minus 7.95 E23, give or take a little bit of rounding. I could have made an extra 2.25 times 10 to the 23. It never actually got made. And the emphasis here, again, this is still water. This is not the excess yet. This amount could have been made from the amount of oxygen volume that's left over. Let's now figure out how many liters of oxygen is just sitting there waiting to make this amount here. So we're going to take the 2.25 times it by 23. So that's molecules. Again, I remind you that when there's still water, we're going to undo the Avogadro number. So divide Avogadro's number out. That's molecules in a mole. This time, my mole ratio is going to be for every six parts water, there's five parts oxygen. For every six parts water, there's five parts oxygen. And then we want to go to liters. So one mole is 22.7. You can do your answer in liter, no problem. It's just be aware, um, especially when you're reading questions, they're actually good to have it written as decimeter cube as opposed to liter uh, because um, it's closer to the SI unit. So 2.25 E23, divide out Avogadro times 5 over 6 times 22.7. And this gives me here, we have 7.1 uh, decimeter cube. Out of the 30 that I had, I still have a good 7 or so left over uh, to actually react. If you then buy more ammonia, then I can start reacting using up some of the success. But until then, we have 7.1 there. Let me do one other spin-off to this question here. So far in this problem, we have been assuming a perfect world. Both of these numbers are by stoichiometry. Both of these are referred to as the theoretical yield. In a perfect world, if there were no random errors, systematic errors, if there's no impurities or problems with the experiment, 15 grams should give you the 7.95 number, the 32 should give you 1.02. Usually you've done enough labs by now, there's always going to be some problems going along the way, maybe the reaction doesn't go 100%. Usually I get even less than this number, and that's referred to as an actual yield. So let me just do a quick little spin-off just on the side here. I didn't ask you this uh, initially, but... Uh, Given, let's say part D, D okay. given uh, 6.00 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water form. So that number there is referred to as an actual yield because I couldn't have predicted this, right? They went in the lab and they actually measured how much uh, water they end up getting. They got this number here. What you can calculate is you can calculate a percent yield. Let me just zoom in for you. Uh, the percent yield is essentially. Let's take the 6.00 that they actually got, times 10 to the 23, divide out the 7.95 that it should have gotten, and because this is a percent, I'm going to multiply that by 100, uh, 6E23 divided by 7.95E23. This one gives me here some 75.5%. Uh, this doesn't mean that they're terrible as a, a chemistry student. It could very well be there's a lot of errors that came into play. Uh, it could be the reaction really doesn't go to completion all that well. Maybe it hits an equilibrium. We'll see that in another chapter in our course here. Uh, but basically, that's just one small little spinoff. And what I want to show you is it's even tinier uh, than the small number that I calculated. It is not just, oh, let's go small number divided by big number. In fact, both of these were still theoretical. Right? So lots of practice uh, with... Um, practicing through the number crunching, uh, practicing through your stoichiometry. Uh, what we're going to switch over now is we're going to switch over to just overviewing unit two. Uh, again, you can look through that uh, summary package for a little more detail. For unit number two here, this one here was a little bit more of a breather. This one had a little bit less math. This one here was focused mainly on atomic structure. So I was looking at sort of different models of the atom here. Uh, at first, we started off this unit looking at the different scientists. You do need to know the name of the scientist along with their model. So we started off with Dalton here. 
For Dalton's model here, we had the solid sphere model. Basically, he had this idea, if you take a bulk sample, he imagined that if you had a sharp enough knife, you can separate these atoms one from the other, and eventually you're going to end up with tiny, tiny particles, which have all the properties of the atoms. So some uh, added features that he had, uh, he had this notion that atoms were neutral. So there's nothing tinier than an atom. This is as small as you can get it. This is indivisible. Uh, what made uh, elements different from each other here? Uh, each element has different atoms. We now know sort of in hindsight, oh, it's because of protons. At this point here, he didn't know about protons. Uh, he kept the sort of this list of pure substances, this list of different types of atoms here fairly short. How do you explain all the variety of life? He, he said, okay, atoms can actually combine and actually bond together in different proportions. Um, so elements bond, if you want to look into the detail, you can look into elements bond with, you can say, multiple proportions or even different proportion, uh, definite proportions. So they basically combine in different fashions, forming what are called compounds. And although the compounds will be built uh, from the different elements, uh, basically the compounds will have very different properties as the elements themselves. In fact, uh, for a chemical reaction, basically it's just the bonds that are breaking, bonds that are sort of moving different places. By combining different numbers of them together, we actually have a totally different species. So going from Dalton, uh, that was the overall model for a good 100 years, uh, in the 1800s or so. Uh, came along a guy called Thompson. For Thompson, uh, his model here was the plum pudding model, or the raisin bun model. Essentially for him, he was playing with old uh, TV sets here. He actually had discovered not only were particles charged, he actually discovered the charged particles had to be tinier than atom. So in that case there, for plum pudding here, essentially he took uh, Dalton's atom, and basically he has, nowadays we call them electrons, there's these negative plums that are just sort of speckled through the atom. It's not that the atom can't have charges, but it's just the fact that my number of positives has to be cancelled out by the number of negatives, and that'll guarantee me I still uh, stay neutral. So that's why we actually find the way to actually count the number of electrons. Uh, for him, it's a bunch of these negative plums amidst a positive background. Uh, some 10 years later, uh, we have Rutherford. I believe it was a grad student of Thompson's. For Rutherford, there's a nice feature in science is we want to make sure that any model that we had not only is consistent with older models, but it's sort of subjected to the test. Basically, if I run new experiments and get new data, maybe my understanding of the atom might actually change. So for Rutherford here, uh, Rutherford, he was most well known, not even his model yet, uh, but for the gold foil experiment. For this gold foil experiment, essentially, he shot in a bunch of alpha particles. Around this time, he, we had discovered other subatomic particles, other particles that are tinier than atom. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to test whether Thompson's model really had negatives just sort of speckled out just every which way. Because what would end up happening is the positive charges would end up experiencing some attractions as it gets closer to a negative charge. There's a sort of Coulomb attraction, opposites uh, attract, and basically he had predicted because of this random orientation here there shouldn't be any really big deflection pretty much the alpha particles should be able to cut straight through the ones that were really strange to him were seemingly it would hit the atom and actually come back the way it came so he knew something was off in the thompson model so for him what he did is he took all that positive background all that positive material he squeezed it into a tinier core We'll still say the atom is still roughly that size, as marked by the electrons on the outside, but we now have a really dense core. Uh, those ones there are made out of protons. There's a fellow named Chadwick that discovered neutrons around this time as well, but that was actually a much denser core. We call it the nucleus. The nucleus uh, made out of protons and neutrons. We can call those nucleons if you like, particles of the nucleus. Definitely the protons hate each other. There's actually constantly repelling away were it not for in science, something called the strong nuclear force. It's like an imaginary set of hands that are squeezing this nuclei. The nuclei are constantly pushing away from each other here. Our nuclei would actually sort of uh, separate. But we have a nucleus there. It's about a thousand times smaller than the distance to the where the shells are, the radius are. And basically Bohr came along. He took this idea and he did uh, studies with absorption and emission. And basically he figured, well, electrons can be in any number of orbits going out. We had actually counted um, electron orbits from inside out, so shell 1, shell 2, shell 3, and those ones are actually amounted to main energy levels. 
for Bohr, however, even though uh, Bohr said every atom should have an infinite number of uh, shells available to it, it's not like this atom here can get infinitely large. So what we d started seeing was for Bohr, when we do this on an energy level diagram, you can picture we have a nucleus somewhere down here. For being electrons on shell number one, I'm a negative charge, I want to be as close to the core as possible, that's going to have the lowest potential energy. In that case, they are most stable. The lower the energy, the more stable something is. As I get farther and farther away from the core, I'm not as close as I could be. There's going to be a little bit more uh, instability. Instability means the energy between the charges are actually a little bit higher. So shell 2, shell 3 actually starts getting farther and farther out. And as I start getting out to shell 10, shell 100 or so, what we're going to end up seeing is we're actually going to see that the shells end up converging together. That's because the uh, electron shells themselves can't get infinitely far away or else my atom would get infinitely big. There's only a certain amount of attraction from the nucleus. So let's just write this down in words here. Uh, since uh, there is a finite, there's a limit amount of attraction to the nucleus, what we find is we find that the so therefore, our uh, energy levels for the different shells, energy levels converge, the word converge means comes together. Usually they say at the high frequency end or the high energy end, and that's when we see this sort of stacking up, and we definitely see that in terms of our series as well. So uh, Bohr basically, to sort of discover this, uh, he uh, did an experiment with sort of absorption and emission. He started off with elements like hydrogen, and basically by sending in energy of a very unique amount of energy, if that energy is perfectly what it needs, this electron can actually jump up into some higher shell. Let's say it jumps up to shell number three. Uh, that keyword there, we're going to call it here absorption. So for absorption, uh, we basically are absorbing energy. So uh, we input energy. We input energy and electron jumps from a low shell to a high shell. So it's going to suck away energy. That electron here will be farther away from the ground state than it needs to be. Eventually what's going to happen is it's going to get bored and it's going to want to fall back towards ground state. It just turns out when it tries to fall back towards ground state, it actually has a lot of different options. So let's say it falls straight three to one. The electrons are stuck on the atom. The electrons aren't being ionized in any fashion of the word here. But in that case there, as the electron falls, because of conservation energy, what energy I had input in has to, be, has to be given off. And usually this energy, when it's given off, it's actually in the form of light. If we have the 700 nanometer side and the 400 nanometer side as our visible spectrum here, this gap here is actually fairly large. We're actually going to end up getting a photon that is really highly energetic. So maybe a purple photon here. So every time an electron jumps three to one, purple photon jumps again, another purple photon, another purple photon. And basically, I'm going to get one very unique high-energy photon. What if my electron falls from just, say, 3 to 2? Well, I also need to give off energy. Again, our keywords here is emission, then. For an emission process here, we actually need to release energy, or energy is negative. Release energy, and your electron falls uh, from a high shell, high shell to low shell. So electrons are stuck on the atom, but it's photons that are getting released because this gap here is not as big, we end up getting just a lower energy light. As the electron is on shell number two, it's not done yet, it then falls two to one. The gap between one and two is bigger than two to infinity, so totally not to scale. This one here, it's actually closer on the high energy end. We refer to this one here as a line spectra. Spectra just means a spread. And basically, because Bohr ended up seeing, especially when you use electricity to excite these electrons and they go up into higher shells as they start falling, because they only give off very unique readings, he ended up concluding uh, ele uh, elements were more like this sort of staircase picture. Energy levels are actually discrete. Energy levels are quantized and discrete. So basically, it's uh, more like a staircase than like a ramp. So if you are an electron on the staircase, you can more than happy, you can jump up and down the staircase all you want, but every time you jump between sort of the steps uh, on the staircase, every element has a unique 
sizing to the staircase. So every element will give off a very unique uh, line spectra, and that actually becomes a fingerprint for that element. So astronomers do this all the time. They point out their spectroscopes uh, deep into space here. They see the light that's given off in the stars, and they can actually match it up uh, to elements that they know. This is a super unique amount of energy. We use the Rydberg equation to actually solve for if the electrons jump uh, between certain gaps here, what's the corresponding energy? Uh, the formulas that they want you to practice definitely is the fact universal wave equation. C is equal to lambda f. Be really careful for f. Uh, they sometimes use free, uh, the new symbol. They actually use something like a squiggly v like that as a symbol. But basically what it's saying here is C is the speed of light through vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8. Uh, things start getting really weird when we get close to the speed of light. Uh, you study that in your physics classes here. Lambda here is your wavelength. This is the distance between crest and crest, so this is going to be in meters, usually we're in the ballpark of nanometers for visible light. And the frequency, even though I know light doesn't rock back and forth like this, but metaphorically, if I were sitting on a boat and this light wave here just zips by me, as the light wave pushes by me, I'm going to actually start oscillating, rocking up and down, I'm going to count in one second at a time how many full cycles, how many full up and down motions do I end up getting, and that's referred to as uh, the frequency. So this uh, F here, so frequency, uh, frequency is actually the number of cycles uh, per second, and that's actually going to be measured in a unit called Hertz, HZ. It's the number of cycles per second. Because the speed is ridiculously fast and the wavelength is not that far away, I'm going to rock up and down on the order of millions or billions of times after every second that passes by. Right? So basically it says to us here, wavelength and frequency are opposites. If you know the frequency then, you can use what's called the Planck equation. The Planck equation says the energy is actually proportional through uh, the frequency. Planck's constant is given in a data booklet here, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. We had our frequency from earlier, and this one here gives you the energy of a photon. We're going to find that this energy that it leaves with, uh, it's going to be expressed in joules here. The energy per photon may not be that high, but if you imagine a whole uh, laser beam, uh, basically you have many photons one after the other, uh, the energy stacks up uh, really, really quickly. Uh, so a couple other side notes before we get to our electron configuration model. Um, remember, it's a very unique amount of energy that's being given off based on the staircase. Same thing for the absorption. The energy that we had to give in has to be of a really, really specific reading. Nobody has the time to do that. So what we decide to do for an absorption is we decide to send in all the wavelengths. Let's send in the entire rainbow between 700 and 400 nanometers. So the 700 side is the red side. So red, orange, oops, uh, red, orange, yellow, uh, maybe more GBiv, right? They're not evenly spaced, but at least uh, the relative ordering of them is very similar. Um, so we have this as the visible region here. Instead of trying to fine tune exactly the amount of energy, what I'm doing is I'm doing a catch-all. I'm sending in all the possible light colors that I might take. And then if I have, let's say, a 3 to 2 gap is corresponding to one particular red region, oh, because I sent in all the red wavelength, I'm just going to be missing that uh, entry. I'm going to have one that's a green between 2 to 1, so I'm going to have one that's sort of missing that wavelength. I'm also missing the one that's purple. It's sort of like a negative of what I had from earlier. So in Chapter 3, we made use of the idea here in absorption spectra. I basically send in uh, a light into a transition metal ion, and basically there's a color that gets absorbed. We end up seeing uh, the remaining color. Right? More on that in the next chapter. Uh, let's end off our recap here in Chapter 2 here. We end up sort of modifying our understanding to something called the electron configuration model. This one here was what ended up looking like a lot of gibberish, but essentially it's just a roster full of where all the electrons ended up. Pretty much if you start off with the Bohr model with the energy level diagram, the Bohr model was a little bit too simplistic because shell number one, uh, we started using SPDF as the different types of orbitals. Those are just placeholders. We started seeing the shapes as well. Uh, for shell number one, sure, we're still boring because we're still just uh, a 1s orbital. Shell number two, now we're getting a little bit farther from the core, shell number two can actually be subdivided into two floors. There's one floor, that's the S. There's another floor, that's P. Every time we have the P rooms, they always show up in triplets. There's the dumbbells that are off by 90 degrees, so this is going to be 2P. Uh, shell number three, even more energetic. So shell number three starts dividing. 
we have a 3s. Again, every time the p room show up, they always come up in triplets, so 3p. And then we have a 3d. Strangely enough, when we get to shell number 4, right? shell number 4, so that's shell 3, shell number 4 here is also going to subdivide into 4s and whatnot. What we end up seeing is the 4s actually ends up lower energy than the 3d. Now, every element will have a very different number of nucleus, a right, different number of protons, so the energy spacings between the relative gaps here would be different. We just talked about that um, uh, emission spectra analogy. But basically, the ordering that we fill them in is always going to be the same. Uh, we always do our off-ball principle. When we off-ball, it's basically we're building up from the ground state. Electrons like being close to the ground. Electrons have this property called spin. Just for convention, we put in the upspin going first. We have a guy called Pauli that says uh, every orbital can only handle a maximum number of two electrons, and they actually have to be opposite spins. To understand spin here, you can imagine spinning one way, like if it rotates clockwise, maybe that's referred to as spin up, maybe that's an up spin arrow. If the electron here along the same axis actually spins the opposite way, we can call that a spin down. Outside the element, the electron can switch spin no problem, it's just that when it goes in, it actually has to be a down spin. And essentially what you did is you started filling in these um, electrons, up spin, down spin, all that. And then when we got into the P's here, we needed our last rule here called the Hun's rule. In this case here, because we have what is referred to as degenerate orbitals, degenerate means equal energy, there's three equally good spots to sit in. Electrons here, because they're all a negative charge, uh, they're going to prefer to go in uh, one shell by themselves. So if I was the next person on the bus here, I'd get on my own seat, own seat, own seat, and I only have to pair up until um, I really ran out of seats. I'm still obeying Pauli because every orbital is only holding two. It's just that I have three of these orbitals here, so I can end up having more. Uh, there were a few uh, little exceptions here and there. So for exceptions, let's take a look at uh, copper's configuration and chromium's configuration. They can do what's called a full configuration, which means start off from 1s2 and build all the way up to um, the highest shell. From what I've told you so far, I would have said 4s to 3d9. You'll notice here for the 4s and 3d, first thing, they're really close in energy. But you notice that for the d9, I'll do a Hunt's rule here, I'm actually really close to having full shell. Noble gases are actually stable because of the full shell. What copper is going to do is it's actually going to promote one of its 4s electrons up into uh, 3d10. So therefore, as an exception, 4s1, 3d10 along with any elements underneath it. We can also do what's called a core notation or a simple configuration. Core notation uses the noble gas, uh, with the exception of helium, which is 1s2. Most of your noble gases end off in a p6. So 1s2, two electrons on the first shell, eight electrons on the next shell. I look for sort of the last p6. I use the noble gas. In this case, here should be argon. And I just do the last shell. Chromium is 4s2, 3d4. And in a similar fashion here, there's something about having a half-filled shell that also makes you stable. Uh, it allows me to have all parallel spins. It improves my paramagnetism in Chapter 3. If I promote that one electron up, as an exception, 4s1, 3d5. So even without becoming charged, those ones there are a little bit strange. And then now what we can do, in this chapter we can make any number of charges. I can make positive charges, negative charges, all whatever I want. To make anions, it's not that hard. So let's say CR, I know it doesn't want to do this, but let's say it ends up gaining one electron. So I get CR minus one. Wait, CR is a metal, it doesn't want it, but I'm forcing that electron on it. Basically what that means is another person arrives for your anions, you just add it to the next available spot. So argon, I used to be 4s1, 3d5 like this. Now that I have room on the 4s, that next electron will then occupy this spot here for anions. We add electrons to the next lowest energy spot. That could make this isoelectronic the same configuration as uh, other atoms. Or what you can do is you can end up becoming charged. Uh, let's charge positive. Uh, let's say copper here. Let's say it lost two electrons. Right. So I want to make Cu plus two. Uh, remember, there's a very special ordering for making these um, for making these uh, configurations here. Uh, so we had already said 4s1, 3d10, right? Something about having a full shell makes you stable. That's what made you an exception. To make you cations, basically what I'm doing is I'm actually going to lose electrons or I'm pulling away electrons. 
uh, in the fancy terminology I can say it gets oxidized. I remove electrons, there's a special ordering, we remove it P first, then S, then D, then F. And this has to do with the notion that P and S orbitals are counted as outer shells. These ones here account for your valence, so Bohr model can only show S and P. So the second that we start entering our transition metals that start having Ds, I can't represent them well. Uh, the Ds and Fs are inner uh, orbitals there. Those don't behave uh, in the same type of bonding until they actually get hybridized. I can't touch any inner shells until the outer shell is gone. So I can make that note as well. PSDF, but this has to be on uh, the outer most energy. So core notation does this really good job of it. Core notation doesn't let me touch uh, shell 1, shell 2, shell 3. Even though I do have some P's in here, I can't touch any of those. I'm only looking like layers of onion at the outermost shell first. Well, I don't quite have my four P's yet. The first electron I pull off is not the last one that I put on. I actually got to pull off the 4S. And in this case, because I lost two, okay, then I can pull off my 3D. That gives me an incomplete D shell that puts me in the transition metal category. And that actually ends up making copper 2 actually colored in solution. Right? So have a look at some of the review problems in chapter 1, chapter 2, and we'll pick up our review from there tomorrow. Thanks, guys.